Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Schaefer's Market Mashup. Thank you for being patient with me as I battled Cincinnati's highest pollen count in 30 years. But hey, I'm better. I'm here. I'm through it. So let's get right to it. Uh, please welcome entrepreneur extraordinaire Lee Drogan. Lee, what is happening? Awesome. Thanks for having me, Patrick. Uh, well, when he's not tweeting about hockey, uh, Lee is the <laughs> founder and CEO of Estimize Inc., I see as a peer-driven fintech platform uh, designed to collect data for earnings analysis and market trends. But I guess we can jump right in and s you can go with how you got started with Estimize. I know you had some stock twits um, experience prior to that, but walk me through your thought process behind Estimize and you know, I took a look around the site. I, I joined. It's very expansive, very community driven. Uh, so just unpack that for me to start. Yeah, so my background uh, is originally from uh, the systematic equity quant trading uh, kind of, you know, piece of uh, the ecosystem. And um, one of the strategies that uh, we ran at the first shop that I worked at as an analyst and then a PM was based around the inefficiency of those sell-side analyst estimates, namely the Thompson Reuters IBIS data set. Mm -hmm. And what we were doing was we were, we were basically attempting to better understand what was actually baked into the market um, by the time the company reported, and then look at what the real surprise was instead of, um, you know, instead of just going off of the sell side number, which we all know is kind of biased and skewed and yes. they sandbag the numbers. And especially when you get a high growth technology company that reports, you know, the, they were, you know, they, they guide, they sandbag the guidance and then the sell side sandbags their estimates with the guidance. Mm -hmm. And then they beat by, you know, 5% on the revenue, but yet the stock is down. Well, that's because, you know, the buy side really thought it was going to be 8% on the revenue or, or whatever. So, um, you know, we took advantage of that, made a lot of money off of it. And uh, fast forward a couple of years, I yeah, I was part of the first team at StockTwits there in the first two years after Howard founded the company. And what we started to see, uh, even on StockTwits, was uh, the community make estimates on the stream for, you know, what is Apple's iPhone number going to be? And you know, what are the earnings going to be? And basically, um, you know, the story goes that I wanted to build Estimize at StockTwits. And I asked Howard uh, several times if I could have, you know, the group of engineers to go do it. And Howard did kind of the best thing I can ever ask for anybody uh, to do, you know, that works for you is um, he basically, after the third time, came to me and said, Lee, I'm firing you. I'm accelerating your options. Here's some severance. And here are a couple of investors that I'm going to introduce you to who are going to invest in your company to build this product because it's a good idea. It's just not going to happen here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went off and uh, we built it and we launched it in January of 2012 and it worked. Um, and so it's been a lot of fun since then. Probably the best severance package in the history <laughs> yeah. of fintech maybe. That's... Um, I'm sure there are a couple really yeah. big ones these days in crypto and some other stuff. But yeah, uh, that's true. You from, might be from a, from a doing the right thing for your employee perspective. Howard um, is is quite a match. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And you really touched on, I think, a problem that's prevalent in the community where I can't tell you how many times. First of all, I'm on the writing side uh, of everything. When I'm instructing and teaching uh, my employees, and they write and they say, like, I don't understand. It was a, you know, top line beat. Why is the stock down or why is the stock up after it whiffed on estimates? Uh, I think there really is a knowledge gap there that you guys are doing great work in narrowing. Yeah, so the whole point of Estimize was to, uh, from an academic perspective, basically build the collection of these estimates in, in the way that you would if you were starting from scratch, mm -hmm. you know, with a new system. And there are, you know, a set of different um, wisdom of crowds uh, principles that you want to build into a system like this. And uh, they're basically, you want a broad, diverse set of contributors 
you don't want them to be herding together. So you don't want them to see each other's estimates before they make their own. Mm -hmm. You want them to have the correct incentive to provide aggressive estimates and not just be safe with their estimates. And, uh, you know, we, we did that from the very beginning. Um, and so we've been successful at basically, we've got uh, 110,000 contributors to the platform now. Um, we cover basically, you know, all the liquidly traded Russell 3000 names. And uh, the experiment worked in that uh, it ended up being both more accurate on a consensus level about uh, 70% of the time mm -hmm. relative to the IBIS data. But I think more importantly, and this is really what we were attempting to achieve from the beginning, was it ends up that the data set is more representative of the true expectation of the market um, when you go to judge it for how does the market actually behave relative to the data. So we look at a couple of different time frames as market tests when we say that. Um, one of them is the kind of the pre-earnings period where you get these trends in the consensus numbers mm -hmm. and how does the stock move relative to those trends. And then the second one is really the post-earnings period. So the company surprises, well, did it really surprise in whatever direction you know you think? And we find that there's more alpha in that post-earnings period by kind of benchmarking it against the estimized data than uh, than the Wall Street data. Yeah, that's uh, that's very well said. So for our retail trading audience, how, how does one or like what did you guys learn when reading the tea leaves on these earning trends? And can you walk me through kind of like the guidelines of that 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 someone should use when trying to read and unpack these earnings trends? Yeah, absolutely. So there are two ways to think about uh, playing around earnings. Um, one of them is kind of a more discretionary, you know, I really like this stock. It's a holding of mine, but mm -hmm. I want to understand if I should get heavier or lighter in the name, or I want to understand if it's, you know, a major risk to me, if I have a really high position, really, you know, really heavy position in either direction going into the announcement. The other way to think about it is from a purely kind of quantitative perspective, which is, is there alpha to be picked up by short term trading in a lot of different names throughout a quarter to capture some arbitrage? Yes. Our business, we have an internal quantitative research team. And what we do for our clients, which are mostly large systematic hedge funds and asset management firms, is we build those systematic models that kind of do the, the latter. Mm -hmm. But on the front end of the platform for all of our contributors and our, you know, kind of subscribers mm -hmm. on, on the front end. So you can subscribe to the data set, to the platform, to see all the data without having to contribute as you normally would. We try and give them kind of guidelines uh, uh, regarding using the data for really discretionary purposes. And the way that we view it is this. There's a screener on the platform, and that allows you to basically look at all the different relationships in the data. And so in the pre-earnings period, what we find is that when there's a really big delta between the Wall Street consensus and the estimized consensus, mm -hmm. so estimized is way above the street, kind of in those two weeks before the announcement, we mm -hmm. find the stock tends to drift in the direction of that delta up to the announcement day. So you want to be long the names that have these big positive deltas between Wall Street and Estimize. Okay. But what's really interesting is that in the through earnings period, where you're really taking the earnings risk, where there's a lot of vol, uh, we find that the strategy is actually the exact opposite. So when Estimize is way above the street going into earnings, it's likely that the stock has already surged into the report and it's harder for the company to hop over that kind of expectations mm -hmm. threshold. And thus we find that between T minus one day before the announcement and T plus 20, um, there's negative residual return in that period. So those are your names where there are disappointments, the stock will underperform. And if you're really heavy in those names, you may want to lighten up mm -hmm. if the stock has surged and the estimized consensus is way above the Wall Street numbers. And then in the post earnings period, um, if you're thinking about getting into a position, let's say after the company reports, mm -hmm. uh, let's say the morning after, what we find is that if it surprised significantly, mm -hmm. that there is positive drift in the three days after the report. And so you want to get into that stock right away at the open. 
because there's alpha to be captured there, or you want to get heavier, heavier in your position. If the stock surprised negatively, like really, really negatively, um, there's a lot of negative drift in that first day. But what's really interesting is that um, let's say uh, it's a deep value name and you've been wanting to get into the position for a while. Mm -hmm. And let's say the company has a big disappointment and you really want to get in. You don't want to get in right at the open there. You want to wait one day and then enter the trade. Because what we find is that after that first day for those names that really disappointed heavily, that there's this big positive drift over the next 20. Because what happens is institutional traders come in, they scoop those names up, kind of baby out with the bathwater kinds of things. And there's a lot of alpha there over the next 20 days. So the platform using the screener can kind of allow you to find these situations, match them up to your watch list or, you know, your, your portfolio and uh, alert you when there's a potential to, uh, you know, make those trades. Yeah. It, it, it seems so simple when you, when you think about it like that, as far as identifying the entry points and figuring out when something's already baked in, it feels like something that should have been a foundational piece to an investing strategy, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, and it's only just now becoming prevalent. From a discretionary perspective, yeah, now, uh, from a quantitative perspective, it's been about, yeah, about 30 years since they've been doing kind of this type of stuff mm-hmm. from a systematic perspective. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit just to some broader topics. Uh, I know we exchanged some emails about, you know, the crypto space, and it's, I, I've had conversations with people on, on these podcasts before. And I always want to come at it from a slightly fresher angle because you see all these news cycles and it's all the recycled content. What is something out there that's being overlooked, whether it be an angle, a worry, or a trend? Uh, You you just tweeted a couple of things about it earlier about the the bank. Uh, You just start from there and we can... Yeah, so look, Coinbase is going to come public here this week. Mm -hmm. Um, It's going to be a seminal moment for the space. But uh, what I'm really interested in are basically uh, two things that are going on associated with Coinbase, but not for the sake of trading Coinbase. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're at the very beginning kind of of the, of the crypto space, if you think about the fact that Coinbase is basically a bucket shop. And I, I say that um, without malice, right? Like, yeah. I don't say it in a pejorative sense, but like, technically, Coinbase is a bucket shop. And... Uh, Thus, it can charge really high fees. And so, you know, they're taking an average of 50 bips in uh, fees off of every trade. And that's incredibly high when you think about modern brokerage for assets, right? Like maybe if you're talking about like, you know, institutional bond sales or something like that. But, you know, still, it's it's egregious and it's going to come down. Mm -hmm. And um So I I think when you look at Coinbase's valuation, something around $100 billion, you know, relative to Binance, and more importantly, I think relative to what we call these DEXs, the distributed exchanges, like Uniswap, um, I think those distributed exchanges are likely very undervalued relative to Coinbase. And today, um, you know, Uniswap's up 24%. And I think you're going to see this major run in these uh, these distributed exchanges as people realize that um, they're knocking at the door of Coinbase in terms of the fees. And uh, you basically can invest in the whole value of those through their coins. So I think that's a really interesting place, um, you know, to be putting money right now. I think there's also... For me, a lot of interest in the the DeFi space at large, mm-hmm. uh, because you know the the crypto space, and it's again very, very, very early. But we've basically just written a new banking system from scratch. Yeah. And um, if you kind of think about what's going on from a fundamental perspective, you can now be the bank, right? By yeah. lending money in the form of crypto, by staking it, you know, so that people can take out loans. And we don't need a middleman and you are the one that can get that yield now. And all of these kind of DeFi protocols give you the ability to invest in uh, people becoming banks. And uh, I think that's a really interesting concept long term. Would I want to if I didn't know anything about it? And I'm still a a noob for a lot of this. (laughs) 
really, really difficult, right, to figure out which project and which one's going to be which. There's something called um, the DeFi Pulse Index, and you can actually just buy one coin that represents the index itself. And I've done that in my personal account, and um, and I think that that's a good decision probably for people who you know don't want to do all the research for each individual kind of protocol. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm definitely in that boat too because I don't know you're in finance from Maker from you know any of these things. They're they're very complicated. Uh, but that's a good solution. And I, I feel like it's just like you, know, you, you, one goes down or something like that. You three more pop up. And they're, they're they're growing yep. like weeds. And I think the rate at which you can try to retain that information, you, you you can't keep up unless next thing you know you find yourself down the rabbit hole. Um, so I think something simple like what you you just mentioned is a start at least. Uh, yeah. But you but you are onto something. Is the self ownership of everything about it does have staying power? I think. Um, so yeah, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. It's just daunting to kind of look at something like that, that we won't really understand, but we understand the concepts behind it in the context. Yeah, look, it. it's, this is, this is literally, if you had to open up a bank and understand all the guts of a bank yep. and how a bank works, like that's what they've done here, except they did it intentionally with crypto because getting the nerds involved in wanting to play around with the guts of a new banking system is the boot program for everybody else wanting to be involved in right. it. And eventually, somebody will make the user experience of all these things really, really simple, yes. and we'll all get involved. And that's kind of, in a way, that is the bullish thesis on this, yes. is that it's so early <laughs> that if eventually they do that, the growth in this is going to be massive, and yeah, I don't want to play early stage VC with each of these individual pro no, projects, right? I not. just want to own a kind of market cap weighted index of the top 15 or so, so that I don't have to know anything about it. I just want to invest in the trend. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's, I came to that conclusion myself, I'd say two or three months ago. And I think that's what most people want is they, they, they don't want to crack the code, solve the puzzle. They just want a piece of the action. So that's interesting. Um, and then speaking of you know piece of the action, I know we also talked about the ARC innovation. And I think that's something really that I don't think a lot of retailers, retail traders are quite familiar. So do you want to give like a little broad introduction and in what you're seeing? And, and I'll try to fill in as, as, I'm, as I'm getting up to speed as well. Yeah, look, Kathy Wood and the ARC stuff touches just so many different uh, major arguments mm -hmm. and uh, and discussions and trends that are taking place today. So, you know, just some of them are um, why has growth outperformed value? Why have we seen historically high multiples in high growth tech stocks relative to almost any time in history except for the tech bubble? Yeah, um, ridiculous. Do do those multiples deserve to be higher because there's more innovation taking place today than at any point in history that disruption is happening faster? So should there be a disruption multiple uh, that's more significant? Um, there uh, is just massive change taking place in regards to the way that ETFs capture assets, mm -hmm. right? And what happens when an ETF that inherently is investing in a limited pool of kind of assets, because she's got a very specific type of investing strategy, what happens when they own 25% of the market cap of a $2 billion stock, right? Yeah. Like, is there enough liquidity to get in and out? Is Are the flows into the ETF actually driving the performance of the stock price? And is that a problem if people choose to take money out of the ETF? There's just so many different interesting things going on here with ARK. And my own personal take on it is that um, I think Kathy Wood is correct in the sense that uh, we are in a super cycle for technology eating mm -hmm. basically every industry. Yeah. And you want to be invested in low asset, high innovation, um, you know, uh, companies because, um, you know, you, you don't want to have a heavy asset, uh, you know, balance sheet. Um, we've seen that the 
uh, the valuation on intangible assets has grown considerably relative to kind of hard assets. Some of the quants have been having serious problems with this because a lot of their models were based on the valuation of non-intangible yeah. assets. Um, and so, uh, but I don't think that trend is going away at all. Uh, you know, we've, saw, we've seen software eat the world as uh, Mark Andreessen kind of predicted a decade ago, but I think that it's now eating a lot of other things, um, you know, that he didn't even predict. And she's on top of this trend. Um, the problem I have with it and why I'm not invested in the ARK ETF, you know, as kind of the proxy for my own equity trading strategy, which is almost purely momentum. Mm -hmm. I'm a momentum trader at heart. And so it fits directly into, you know, her philosophy. But my problem is that she's invested in some companies very heavily like Tesla here, where I just find it a little bit hard to believe there's that meat on the bone yeah, going forward, right? Like, no, no like my, whole, there. my whole my whole philosophy is you want the middle of the trend. You don't want to be early and you definitely don't want to hang around late, right? But that middle 80% of the trend just has a ton of returns. And I think some of the names that she's really heavy in here, she's just kind of pushing assets into these stocks because she needs to push assets yes. somewhere and it's hard. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, we wrote something, I think it was yesterday, maybe over the weekend, where we talked about kind of wild card factors for certain areas. And I think I, our, our wild card factor for, for ARC, I think was one sentence and it was just every day is a wild card day for Kathy and her ETFs. That's if you, if you want to strap on and enjoy the ride, be my guest, but it's, it's, um, there's a lot of choppy water to navigate there. I feel like my other, my other like general issue with her whole business is basically that from a from an asset manager perspective, I understand that she wants to be fully invested at all times, right? And mm -hmm. on in in interviews, she has said that basically the way that they kind of pull back from the market after huge runs where they feel that things are overvalued mm -hmm. is not to go to cash. It's to basically try and lower the beta of their portfolio by rotating into what she feels are lower beta names. But the problem is that she's basically rotating into names going from a beta of like two and a half to going to a beta of like one and a half, yeah, right? It's, that's and not like, enough. Just go to cash, you know, mm -hmm. like, can we just go to cash here, please? You, you're up 300%, just go to cash. <laughs> and, um, and so like, I feel that uh, when you can use some basic momentum overlays to, you know, kind of get you out when that drawdown starts, instead of having a drawdown of like 35 or 40%, you know, which is kind of what her strategy entails, and she's willing to stomach that, um, you know, you can kind of play some of those names yourself and use a little bit tighter risk management strategy to maybe keep that drawdown to like 20% so that you don't want to throw up all over yourself. Yep. Actually, that makes me feel a lot better about myself because I've been saying go to cash for for, for a <laughs> while now. So, hey, I... So, you know, we, we kind of mentioned a couple, well, one, your, your, your guts analogy was on Twitter. I, I giggled at that as I was, as doing my research here. Uh, and this relates a little bit to your, to your stock twits experience as well. You have a very engaging Twitter profile presence, not meant to like gas you up or anything. I just, it, it, you know, you're, yeah, yeah. you're all over the place there. Uh, and I really have, have found the connection between social media and investing. I'm all over stock twits. Uh, I took over Schaefer's Twitter around a year ago and, and trying to pump those numbers up. What, what do you see, where do you see as that trending towards between the, the relationship in social media and investing? So, you know, I, I look at it from my own perspective first and then, you know, trying to extrapolate off of that and, you know, I got onto Twitter back in 2000, 2009, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the reason I got involved because I saw it as kind of a trading journal. Um, yeah. I think that traders do really well when they feel like they are not necessarily responsible to somebody else, but responsible to themselves mm -hmm. in a public way. And, uh, you know, none of, none of us are getting arbed because we're not trading enough size you yeah. know, to get our ideas arbed, right? Um but putting stuff out there, being intellectually honest, being intellectually honest with yourself, having to almost explain your own ideas to yourself, I think is a great, 
I think it's a, a great thing to do. Um, and StockTwits, you know, the reason I got involved in StockTwits at a very early time was because I felt that that was a community that was focused specifically on that. Um, but there's one really interesting story. Uh, I remember very early on at StockTwits, I was on the phone with a prominent member of, or not a prominent member of the community, but a, a very public figure who was coming onto the community. Okay. And I was, I was looking at his, uh, his stream and I was looking at it, I was like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing on here. Like, you know, like you should be doing this, that, and the other thing. And I was on the phone with him and I was saying these things to him in a very nice way. <laughs> but Howard, Howard overheard me. And I remember Howard literally while I was on the phone screaming at me saying, no, never tell somebody else how to use stock twits or Twitter. That's not your place to do that. We want people to figure out what's good for themselves what makes sense for themselves, what's valuable to themselves, and what you think is valuable may not be what's valuable to that person. And he was 100% correct. And I learned my lesson like right there that day. And so, you know, I have friends and colleagues who use Twitter and stock tweets in very different ways from what I do. Yes. And even my own kind of use of it has changed over time significantly from just posting that to being more of all of who I am. And the hockey stuff and the <laughs> politics stuff and the geopolitics stuff and the, you know, economic stuff on top of the trading. Um, and then it was obviously very helpful for building Estimize uh, at large, the, the community there, you know, so, so everybody has their own perspective on it and you just have to know what you want to get out of it. And that may change over time in terms of, kind of where this whole social thing is going the last, you know, three or four months has been really interesting mm -hmm. because kind of everything that we had been working on for the last 10 years at stock twits and estimize kind of happened all at once. Yeah. It's right? all become with accelerated. The, yeah. With the GameStop stuff and, um, and then all, you know, it's like overnight success, right. Yeah. Oh, of the concept. That February month was, so, I mean, it was, <laughs> in, I, not that I have this long decorated experience, but it's, I've never seen anything like that in, no. in watching it happen. So yeah, keep going. Yeah, look, so, you know, I think the, I think the retail trader kind of um, mania that's gone on is transitory in nature, right? Like yeah. there's no way everybody could keep this up. It no. was I no. was getting calls. I was getting calls from my, my uh, microbiologist friend in St. Thomas down in the Virgin Islands saying, how do I open up a, an account so I could trade penny stocks, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's just, you're at a point there where it's not uh, healthy. Oh, I mean, I had some of my dumbest friends giving me advice, <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like, can we just, I, yeah. I, I don't want to do that. So yeah, that, and that's and that's what I always find fascinating about the dichotomy between social media and investing is, yes, it's out there, it's in short, compact, bite-sized form, but is it reputable? It, you know, are, are you getting actionable advice behind it? Uh, and, and I love what you said about kind of adjusting, because I actually talked to somebody um, a, a higher up in the uh, Twitter sphere, I, I guess I, I'd call it. And they gave me this kind of laundry list of this, that, and this that he saw wrong with our profile. And I sat down and looked at it and said, like, look, dude, that's not what we're looking for. That's not the audience that I'm trying to build. It, it, it really does depend on the user and what they want to achieve. So I'm glad that someone else out there understands that and, and, and gets that. So... Thank you. Yeah, there's look, you know, on the other side of that, there there's a lot of useful information. I feel like, you know, Estimize is built as a structured platform so that you can understand just the data without all the other Michigas. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, StockTwits and, and and Reddit and Twitter and all these other platforms. I think personally, for me, and I, I say that because you know the lesson from Howard. For me, the lesson is that. Um, uh, you build a curated list of people that you trust to follow uh, that share a similar investing philosophy as you. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you listen to their ideas and uh, you use them as a sounding board. Um, and I think it's been incredibly valuable for me. Uh, you know, some of the people that I follow, you know, some of them do work at hedge funds and some of them just run really big personal books yeah. and uh it's incredibly valuable to follow their ideas and bounce ideas off of them and then in general even the kind of more macro data coming out of uh you know the reddit sphere and kind of the aggregated sentiment i think if used correctly can be very valuable to understand potentially 
you know, where, um, where trends in companies are going and what's the hot new retail name and, uh, you know, where the money that's going to pile into the next tech company is going to be. And if you're a momentum trader like me, you know, that's, uh, that, that's very valuable if used correctly. Yeah. I think there are just so many breadcrumbs on there, uh, that you'd be insane not to check that out every day, not every day, but as, as often as possible to, uh, to kind of stay involved. Um, all right. Well, I'm, you know, we're about running out of time here. I always like to end with uh, a chance for you guys to promo, plug, whatever you guys want. So I'll give you the floor. Uh, what do you guys got going on at Estimize? Yeah, look, I, I, we'd love everybody and anybody to be a part of the community, to contribute their own estimates. We're coming around into earnings season. So yeah. uh, it's completely free to get involved with. Uh, if you you know, would like to access the data without contributing, can become a, a client of ours pretty easily. We've got the factor models that represent those strategies that I talked about, which you can access. And um, yeah, as I said, the community, the data set only gets better as the community continues to grow. So uh, no matter what your level of sophistication is, we've got algorithms to either overweight you or underweight you in the consensus. And that is the whole philosophy is, uh, you know, it's all just based on the data, not, um, you know, not trying to say that the guy at Goldman Sachs is the best analyst just because he works at Goldman Sachs. Very well said. Guys, they even have leagues, like the, the league stuff. I thought, you know, for a competitive SOB like me, I would be all over that. Fascinating stuff. I love it. Thanks for having me, Patrick. Yeah, I appreciate it. Take care, Lee.